walk through fire. It is hard to believe it's it's been almost to the day a year since the record came out. Came out. Yeah, it's it's getting up there. A lot of people describe what you do, or your style, or your sound as country soul. Mm -hmm. What does that mean in your mind? What does country soul mean, and what's the relationship between those two genres? Uh, I feel as though that country and soul almost hatched from the same egg almost in a way. I see so much harmonically that's similar, scale-wise that's similar. Um, and so I see the connectors as much as I see the geographic connectors of an interstate between Nashville and Memphis, <laughs> you know? Like, like it, it feels physical to me, the connection. And so it made sense, um, given the way that my voice works, to pursue the kind of connection between these two genres. In all realism, my voice works in lots of ways and it isn't as simple as country and soul by any stretch of the imagination. On the record, there is classic pop music. I've definitely, I've grown up on like Ella as well and stuff. And so like I've had lots of different things playing into like what, flies out of my face. <laughs> you have a lot of inspirations, people you listen to from your mom and pop's record collection. and It was just, just my mother's, yeah, single up. parent family. It was just, mama was a DJ. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, so growing up in a, in a seaside town in, in Britain though, what was your exposure to country music? Um, that was mama as well. Um, she was a big fan of Dolly, a big fan of Shania. And I grew up dancing around the living room, listening to Dolly, singing um, the Jolene record, singing Shania songs. Uh, I also was really connected. My mum loved Tammy Wynette as well. And like my voice, like I found that when I sang Dolly songs, I sang them differently, but they felt comfortable. Like the runs felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. I was like, that's weird. And like everyone else that, you know, was like young and black in England was, this was like the 90s, right? So it was like the new Jack Swing era and the kind of Brownstone and Lear and Brandy and all those kind of artists. And my voice doesn't sound like that. <laughs> Not one bit. And so I was like, hey, what? Like I'm singing, that feels comfortable and that feels weird. And so it looks like I'm gonna have to go that way and then I'd just go, I'd sing Aretha and I'd sing um, Etta James and Ella Fitzgerald and of course Mavis. And she had that little bit of gravel. Her and Tina had that gravel in the voice. And I was like, oh, because every time I get up into my body, like it turns up. And in the 90s, it was all about being smooth. And I was not smooth. <laughs> <laughs> I can be smooth mm -hmm. sometimes, but. Yeah, well, it you have, was a whole thing, a journey. You have an amazing range, but not just tonal, but textural as well. Your mm -hmm. range is, is, is all over the place. Yeah, yeah. That was a whole thing to discover because I didn't know what I was. <laughs> it was really... Um, so I, I kept on trying to find what I should do with it because like, when I'm soft, Sometimes it can be quite sweet. It's might be my English accent can bring out that kind of the sweetness in my tone. When the power starts coming up, then you can start getting that breaking. It can sometimes get quite flat and almost this kind of twang sound. There's lots that I had to like learn how to use and learn how to kind of place almost because it was all in there. And I felt as though I could sing most things. The only thing I didn't really have was that kind of standard soprano sound, which a lot of the R&B singers had, mm. of that clean, no matter how high in the body you go, just clean, no fur. Um, everything, like, in my voice had kind of complexity, which it took me a long time for to find a place where people would understand what it did and how it was useful. And then it became ubiquitously useful to my detriment. <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I grew up like with a box of offcuts of wood and a chisel and a whittling knife as 
my toys and one board my little pony <laughs> from a second hand store i didn't grow up with things and so like music was another thing that i could connect to that everyone could connect to i didn't feel necessarily as isolated as a child because music was something that if you turned on the radio everyone could talk about what was going on i couldn't talk about that latest toy or those trainers or that computer game like all those things were foreign to me but music was a great connector and so yeah like yeah it was a hard thing to kind of traverse as a kid and definitely even into my teens i found that like music was the thing that connected everyone that i knew and everyone that i grew to love yeah you've said that the songs on walk through fire are are, are about the person you were, not the person you are now. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that? How so? Uh, I refer to past Jola as doormat Yola. <laughs> um, she did the, all the kind of things that are black lady trope, the appearance of strong woman. And we all know that like the perpetual strong woman is only an invitation to neglect um, on a gargantuan scale. Um, when everyone assumes because your complexion is darker than, I don't know, Oprah, um, <laughs> that you are perpetually all right, then like you are almost expected to stand things that no one else would stand if they were teeny weeny and blonde. And so like that whole, um, I suppose, paradigm of um, having to go from looking strong because you feel as though you're supposed to play into that trope to accepting that you're not all the time slowly actually transfer you, transfers you to being stronger on the inside eventually you by embracing your vulnerability by almost broadcasting which is kind of what this album's doing um broadcasting your vulnerability you can gain strength from that but it's a far more multifaceted one, you know. It's not so one-dimensional like kind of all black female characters and kind of all media, <laughs> you know. It's mm -hmm. more nuanced. And so, like, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to put something into the world that was from a black woman and nuanced. So where, where did you or how did you end up in Nashville? How did your inter this interesting journey an adventure you've been on take you to Nashville, Tennessee? Um, well, I'd been to Nashville once before, and it was in 2010. I was writing my way back across America after doing some recording, like out here on the West Coast. And um, it was for a band that I was in. And when I was traveling back, um, I, um, my publisher at the time wanted to set up rights and just to see, like, whether we get on with anybody. We did some rights in LA. Um, we did some rights in Nashville. We did some rights in New York. And um, the rights in Nashville, like the word spread like wildfire because of the structure of everyone having session 10 to one, going to lunch at one till two, and then having the second session two till five. It was so regimented that people that maybe ordinarily wouldn't bump into each other in another city would happen upon each other and serendipitous conversations would occur. And as a result, like our names went around the city real quick. And I just noted that in my brain, put that one in my back pocket for later. I'm like, that's gonna be useful information. Because <laughs> LA wasn't like that. Everyone was driving, they got to their destination. There was no bump into. And New York was too hectic. Mm. Plenty opportunity for serendipity. Mm. Ain't no one got the time. <laughs> and so <laughs> I was like, I'm going to have to choose well um, for the kind of music I'm doing, but also like where I think people are going to have time to understand what I'm doing. And so I chose Nashville for that reason. And when I came back, it was um, with um, a contingent from the UK, the American Music Association in the UK, and we were showcasing. And uh, um, my neighbor did a big old loop. It was 2016, it was six years later from that trip. And I was like, 
They're like, do you want to do this? I'm like, yes, and I know exactly what I'm going to do. I went out before and did a little bit of groundwork about in the April of that year, and then I went out again. And when I went out, I kind of already did groundwork, so like there was a little bit of a loop of my name going around. And the next year was when I met Dan. And uh, Dan Auerbach. Yeah. Another serendipitous meeting. Yes, and my name did a bigger loop that year, and it bumped into Dan's people, and they were like, "Can we get a video of her live performance?" And so he watched that and was like. Can we get her into the studio? Like, when's the next time? And so they found the next available day, and it was like, just straight in. I think we were at Shady Grove or something like that in the first writing session. It was like, straight into writing the record. Very quick worker. Well, it seems like your instincts have served you well. Good instincts mm. and a lot of hard work and a little bit of luck thrown in will yeah. take you a long way. It takes all those things. So <laughs> where do you think you go from here, Yola? What lies ahead? You have a very adventurous spirit, and you've got mm -hmm. a God-given talent that can take you anywhere. So I imagine you have some ideas of where you'd like mm -hmm. to go next. Um, oh, my goodness. Um, of course, one thing I can say is that there is a whole load of touring in my future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be living on a tour bus for a long, 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 long time. Oh, the work. At some point, apparently there's a holiday in the offing at some point. I'm going to try <laughs> one of those things. I really need one. Um, yeah, lots of work. Um, I can say now that um, I'm in a movie. It's, wow. uh, it's uh, the Elvis Presley Project. The untitled Elvis Presley Project as directed by Baz Luhrmann, no less. Wow. And I am Sister Rosetta Tharp in it. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. I'm allowed to say it, which is very exciting. He That's told incredible. me. <laughs> In the meantime, thanks again for joining our very exclusive club here at Austin City Limits. And uh, your name and your photo will be on the wall along Ugh. with the rest. And we hope you'll come back as you, oh, can, yes. as you continue down the road. This is so. glorious. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> it's been fun. It's been a blast.